we're going to have fun. How many of you have ever dreamt of inventing something incredible? Yeah, right? A machine to record your dreams, maybe. Flying shoes. How about this? What about a device that was sensitive enough to measure the tilt and angle of this building if I were to slip a dollar bill under the corner? Or how about one that could detect the change in gravity in this room based on somebody walking in and out? Now, some of us are more detectable than others, right? That's <laughs> how it goes. But what about one that could do both of those things while operating as a clock that didn't lose a second in a thousand years? And what if it was all based on a chip, just like this, that I can hold in the palm of my hand? That is the power of cold atom technology. It's the idea that we can measure many things with the exquisite sensitivity of an atom. So how does this come together, chips and atoms and such? Well, it's all in the word cold. You have to realize that when you're talking to a scientist about temperature, we're actually talking to you about velocity. Hot things go fast, cold things go slow. And if you were to freeze something so cold that its molecules couldn't wiggle, we call that absolute zero. So I want to build your intuition for this. The air in this room, for example, is zipping around at about the speed of sound. That's over 700 miles per hour. Can you imagine doing something with an atom zipping across this thing at 700 miles an hour? That sounds ludicrous, right? But we're good at making things cold. In fact, uh, maybe we can slow things down to the point where this is viable. So I happen to have here some liquid air. This is liquid nitrogen. This stuff is so cold that everything in this room is a boiling red hot surface to it. In fact, if I pour it on my skin, oh, I missed my skin. <laughs> but it doesn't even touch me because I'm so hot. Thank you for that. <laughs> so science is sexy, right? So let's build your intuition some more. What if I were to make these cotton balls, we'll pretend they're atoms, go at about the speed of atoms in a gas at liquid nitrogen temperatures? Now, this is something that I guess to give a disclaimer for. Never do this at <laughs> anywhere. Don't do this anywhere, <laughs> OK? You also might want to plug your ears a little. <laughs> that was a bang, right? <laughs> Scientists can be the life of the party. We just never get invited. <laughs> so did you, see? did you see how fast that was going? There was a lot of energy in that cotton. The fact of the matter is that stuff at liquid nitrogen temperatures is still zipping around at hundreds of miles an hour. We need something so cold that it makes this stuff look hot, OK? So where I work at the Air Force Research Laboratories, we use a technique called laser cooling. And this is how it works. We tailor a laser beam so that an atom moving into it will scatter photons. And we can actually slow them down, stop them, and reverse their direction if we want to. This is like you driving your car down the freeway at 60 miles an hour, and I bring you to a halt in a fraction of a second by firing 2,000 mile per hour cotton balls at you. <laughs> There's a lot of force here. And we can do better, actually. In fact, if we configure our laser beams just right, and we add a magnetic field, well, now we can trap atoms, and we can hold them in space almost indefinitely, wherever we want. Here's how it looks in the laboratory. This is tens of millions of atoms in a trap. And you can see that we can move them at will. We can manipulate them. And now we're talking about something that we can put on a chip, right? So here's how you make a measurement with an atom, I'll tell you. It's uh, incomprehensibly simple. I'll pretend I'm an atom, and let's measure the rotation of the Earth, OK? What we do is I'll get struck by a laser beam, and at that moment, I will start walking in both directions around the fringe of this red dot. And another laser beam will bring me together at the front, and I'll tell you how far the world turned in the time it took me to do that, which can be fractions of a second for an atom, 
That's simply incomprehensible, right? <laughs> I lied to you. <laughs> but you don't have to understand it, because physicists actually still argue about how you can be in two places at once and make this work. But it's beautiful and it's powerful, and it's allowing us to develop devices, the accuracy and precision of which the world has not yet seen. So why do you care? Right? That's the important question we learned. What's it to you? I mentioned clocks. We have great clocks. In fact, a lot of our commerce and industry depends on GPS timing signals, including our power grids and our financial markets. Well, that's actually kind of scary, because GPS is fragile. It's easily jammed. It's easily spoofed. And somebody with half a brain and a little bit more ambition could launch a coordinated spoofing attack that could collapse the grid or make a drop in the markets. But if you integrated them with atom clocks like this, not only would those clocks be better performing, they're unjammable, unhackable, unspoofable. Or what about that gravity sensor I mentioned? If you could detect the gravity of a person walking by, well, then you can measure the weight of water in a river. You can look for underground mineral and oil deposits, or maybe human trafficking tunnels and weapons caches. Or how about this application? This is what I work on. You see, in 1983, there was a flight from Anchorage to Korea whose navigation system malfunctioned. It wandered over Russian airspace, and it was shot down, killing everybody on board. But if you had a device that could detect the change in angle of this building by the width of a dollar bill, you can make a navigation system that will allow a plane to fly halfway around the world and still be within a couple of feet of where it's meant to be. And there are so many more applications, some of which we haven't even thought of. That is the power and potential of cold atom technology.